Well, good day, friends. I'm so glad that you've taken the time to join us for our midweek Bible study. And we have been working through the habits of happiness. The habits of happiness, of course, is a study that we've initiated in the book of Philippians. Philippians being the happiest book in the Bible, a letter written by the Apostle Paul. I wanted to start this ninth study, because we're on number nine, believe it or not, in this study, by going back to the beginning and just reviewing the five laws of happiness. We examined them in the first lesson, but as I was preparing for today, I felt like we needed to go back there for a few minutes and look at why these studies in Philippians are called the habits of happiness, lest someone, once now that we're so far down the trail, kind of loses track of what we were thinking as we began. So let's gl glance at these together once more. Five laws of happiness. The first one, don't look for happiness created. It's not something you look for. It's something that you create. So happiness is something, in other words, let me put it this way. On many levels, you and I are as happy as we choose to be. It's not complicated to understand. Now, to act consistently, to generate happiness, that's going to be another animal, but that's what we're talking about. Number two, this is where most people get bogged. Happiness is not a goal. What's your goal in life? Oh, I just want to be happy. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. All right? Happiness, we said, is a byproduct. Product. It is a derivative of right thinking, right living, and right acting. Making happiness the goal of your life virtually guarantees that you will never be happy. Because happiness is always a spin-off. So if you make it your goal, you're going to likely be miserable. Number three, my habits is my premise, create my happiness. Happiness then is a choice. We shape our habits, then they shape us and our relationship and our destiny. And that's what we've been looking at in some detail as we walk through these verses in Philippians together, is how we create the environment in which happiness, the byproduct, becomes part of the equation. How do I do that? Therefore, number four, happiness based on habits is long standing, but happiness based on happenings or events then is temporary. So I go to Wonderland, I'm happy, I come out, realize how much money I spent, I'm not happy. That's if they ever open the place up again this summer. I have happiness when I get to see a movie everybody's raving about. It's not so great, I come out, realize what I've spent, I'm not happy. So there's all kinds of things that as soon as I get through something, the after the afterglow is gone, the happiness fades. So I don't want that. I want happiness based on habits that can be long term. So I can learn then to be happy for the rest of my life. So number five then, good godly habits are as influential and formidable, that means as unbreakable as bad habits. Some of you have had bad habits, still have them, and you're still dealing with them. You're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s, and something you were doing when you were a teenager, you're still stuck with, and you are fighting and struggling to overcome. So let's flip that around and make this positive. Good godly habits are as influential and as formidable as bad habits, but they are simply much more rewarding. Now notice this though, happiness and the routines that create happiness can be developed. That means they become habitual. They become part of my lifestyle, but they don't come overnight, okay? So the Bible then re reveals some character patterns, some habits that I need to develop on the path to a full-blown experience of happiness. And we're in the middle of one of those right now. The traits I need to require, some of them I would never have pictured. And then there it is right in front of me. Paul sets it out in front of me by example. And I go, oh, is that what that is? 
And so we're in the middle of one of those right now. Because who would have thought that humility is one of the things that I need to get on the road to experiencing happiness in my life. Now, there are many reasons why humility is one of the critical keys that unlocks true happiness. But in our study, we're only going to take the time to develop one of them. We're going to take four weeks to do it. We've done the first. This is week number two now, just in case you're keeping track. So I'm going to urge you on your own time to explore other aspects that the scriptures will represent, will present to you. But we're going to focus on this one for a couple more weeks. And as I said last week, I'm going to warn you in advance, the lessons will be simple, but they will not be easy. And there's a difference there if you haven't recognized it already. So let's confront this thing, literally, because one of the greatest causes of unhappiness in life is conflict. I think I can get an amen on that one. Would you risk an amen on that? One of the greatest causes of unhappiness is conflict. I think we can get consensus there. But the Bible says that the habit of humility is the key to reducing conflict. Did you see the word reducing? I did not say eliminating. Why why did I not say eliminating? Because some conflict is actually good and profitable. But we have all kinds of conflict going on in our relationships that are undes- that is undesirable. And so if we can limit that, we'll be able to deal better with the real positive, powerful conflicts that must come for our betterment and for our blessing. Okay? So, there are many reasons why humility is a key. But we're going to focus on just one, okay? And that is conflict. The Bible informs me that the habit of humility is key to reducing conflict. So then our goal is to reduce conflict through developing godly humility. The Bible declares this in Proverbs 13.10. We looked at it last week. Pride leads to conflict. Pride leads to conflict. And I think I can get general agreement on that. But in the passage we're studying, Philippians chapter 2, we're working on verses 1 to 11 right now. We have here the greatest explanation ever written on planet Earth about the relationship between humility, harmony, and happiness. This passage, Philippians 2, 1 to 11, explains to us First of all, in the first couple of verses, that harmony creates the uh, environment or the context for happiness. In the next few verses, we learn that humility creates harmony. And then in the last few verses, between chapter in chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, the last few verses talk about how Jesus brought both of those things together and experience them in his own life. And we're hoping that that will be our experience too. So let me read you the first three verses of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. I'm going to invite you to find a hard copy of the Bible so that you're staring at it and following along while we're teaching today. And uh, we are going to have a read and a prayer, and then we'll get launched into this second study. Shall we? Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. Here's what it says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then, Paul says in verse 2, make my joy complete, increase my happiness by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Let's pray together and get launched. Father, we are so glad that you said if we would gather together and look at your word, you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come afresh today and do that for us so that we can come become the people that you always intended that we should be. Amen. So, 
Paul says, if you're going to have joy or happiness, first of all, you've got to have harmony. And so I put verse 2 up on the screen, broke it apart myself because there's no colon in that verse if you're looking at it in your Bible. Here's what Philippians 2.2 2 says, and he tells you the four levels of harmony. Make my joy complete, make me happy by, number one, how do I get happy? Being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, being united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Those are the four levels of harmony that we need to be operating on. And so you say, how do we get there, Paul? Then you go to verse 3, and verse 3 says, first thing, right out, right out of the gate, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And last week we discussed that and took it out this way. Four habits for reducing conflict. The first one, never let pride be my guide. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And we discovered that pride is the root of every other sin and that there are two kinds of pride and they inevitably lead to conflict. The Bible, Paul lists them here. One is selfish ambition and the other is vain conceit. I won't go through what those are. You can go back and watch last week and find that out for yourself. But both of these are present. So the first thing that I must do then is never let pride be my guide. But that leads me into the second half of verse 2. I must be humble or I'll stumble. If I'm not humble, my relationships will fall into disarray. Because humility is the basis and foundation of every great marriage, every great friendship, every positive working relationship that you and I have ever had. Because in humility, I don't act like I know it all, so I can treat others with respect. And you learn to give more honor to each other. That's what the verse says. You don't go 50-50. Marriage has never been a 50-50 deal. It's 110% from both sides. You give 110 and your spouse gives 110. You try to outdo each other in honoring one another. You say, what does that mean? That's where we're going. So let's talk about it. Philippians 2, 3 says, Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 here my mouth's going to catch up with me in just a second it says don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather here it comes in humility value others above yourself I like the way or prefer the way actually that the new century version puts it it helps me break it apart just a little better instead they write be humble and give more honor to others than to yourselves. It's, di it's diametrically opposed to what culture tells us. You have to recognize that. Our culture says, I've got to do what's best for me. I've got to look out for number one. I have to consider me first. Hmm. If it feels good, do it. Whatever makes me happy. And all these selfish, self-centered, narcissistic rules have been communicated and demonstrated to me and likely to you all my life by the culture that I live in. But Paul says no. He says be humble and give more honor to others than to yourself. Why don't you circle that word humble in your Bible? Because that's a critical word. We've defined it many times in service time, but I don't know whether I've ever stopped in a Bible study to pull, pull some of the pieces together. Let me do just a couple of things with that here quickly now. Humility is probably the most misunderstood quality that we need in life. A lot of people think humility means going around saying, I'm no good, I'm nothing, I'm zip, I just can't do anything right. That's not humility. Okay, self-deprecation has nothing to do with humility. That's false humility, that's degrading yourself, and that's an offense to God. Why? Well, because the little, as, as the little black lad said when confronted one day, my mama told me that God don't make no junk. If God doesn't make junk, then you're not junk. So self-deprecating comments about yourself are not helpful. 
In fact, you're making God irritated because you're saying he, did a, he didn't do a good job when he put you together. It's saying you're dissatisfied that the God of all creation who knows the beginning from the end and the best from the worst doesn't know what he's doing. Now, the fact that you and I can't figure it out most of the time has nothing to do with the reality that you and I are the best suited people for the place and time that God has placed us, bar none. And if we can find our role and fill that role, we're the best people for the job. God's put us here for a purpose, for a reason, and we're the best ones to make it happen. So no self deprecation. Friends, humility then is not thinking less of yourself. I like this quote from C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. How many of you can see the difference between those two statements? Maybe write it down. That's a great quote from C.S. Lewis. Can you hear the difference though? It's not thinking less of yourself like I'm no good. That's not humility. Humility rather than is this, an accurate self-knowledge that empowers you to help others. An accurate self-knowledge that empowers me to help others. I have to keep in mind the gifts, the talents, the abilities that God has given me and I'll consider how I can best be of assistance to others. And in the context that Paul is speaking, he's not talking about culture. He's talking about the community of faith. Now you can extrapolate and push this into your cultural world, but that's not where Paul is going with this. All right? So you have to recognize that when you push it across the line, you're going where Paul didn't intend. He's talking about what's going on inside the circle of faith. So, the more I think about facilitating other people, especially believers, with what God has blessed me with, the more humble I am. If I walk into a room and the first thing that comes to my mind is, I wonder what everybody else is thinking about me. How do I look? Well, that's based in pride. And the Bible warns me in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction. Like this isn't going to end well. And a haughty spirit before a fall. So don't get too up on the high horse. If you walk into the room, however, and you think, how could I best help, best advantage the people in this room? Then you're being humble. The focus is not on you. The focus is on the other people in the room. So when you come to church on Sunday, if you come, you walk in the door and you say, how can I best bless these people that I'm sitting with today? Well, I'll tell you, if you're sick, stay home. Nobody else needs what you have. If you're healthy and you're ready to worship, then encourage others by worshiping with your whole heart. When it comes to teaching time, focus in so that others too can focus in. Don't be the distracted one that's being a distraction. Focus in on what's going on so that when you walk out, you can intelligently discuss, help, enable others who have questions. What did he say in there? What did he mean by that? Good questions. And you may well have the best answers that anyone could give. So, prepare yourself to bless the community. Humility has to do with what you understand of yourself in connection or in relationship with others. Now, I just talked about coming into church on Sunday. This involves the whole of your life, okay? This is not restricted to, to, to simple church attendance or coming to a Bible study or a prayer meeting. This is far beyond that. This is a habit. This is for whole life. Okay? So, authentic humility then has at its core an accurate self-assessment. How has God equipped me? But it goes further to consider how and where and when I can most effectively bless and benefit other people in the community of faith and beyond with what God has done in me. 
In other words, humility is not putting myself down. Humility is using what God gave me, the skills, the time, the talent, the abilities that I've practiced, that I've refined, and finding opportunities to invest them as God provides to meet the needs of others. That's humility. Using my skill set to build other people up. You see, humble people assist and inspire others. Great people, somebody said, make people feel great. Little people be little people. And our, and our text portion says, instead be humble, give more honor to others. That's critical. Why don't you underline that in your Bible too? Let me adapt some words from that John Maxwell pounded into my head years ago as a young leader and just kind of plug them into our definition this morning. Because that's just, that, well, it's not morning, but you know what I mean. Today, as we look at this, humility is how, where, and when I best add value, because John was always talking about being an added value person, how I best add value to others. So humility then is not denying my strengths. It's recognizing my weaknesses and my limitations. Some of the things that I can do require time. Sometimes the framework that I'm given doesn't allow for that time. Therefore, it's best that I step back and let somebody else take over. That's humility. Recognizing that this isn't in the framework of my skill set. Somebody else can do this better than I can and letting them do it because we're all a bundle of strengths and weaknesses. You have some strengths, you really do, and you have some great weaknesses and humility is being honest about both of them. I have some great strengths, I have some great weaknesses. Just ask my staff, ask my family, they'll tell you. I'm not trying to hide them. Humility is simply being honest about my strengths and my weaknesses. Because the Bible says to be humble and give more honor to others, add value to others. Humility takes the best that I have and offers it to others in the best situation possible so that I can be a blessing, so that I can add value. That's humility. Adding value. How do I take what God gave me and add value to those that are around me? So why should I be humble, you say? Well... Because God makes more promises in the Bible about humility than almost anything else except generosity. Let me give you a few. We'll skip the verses for just for the sake of time. But God makes promises. So let me give you a thing, a few things that God tell, talks about. If you live dependent on him, if you consider others more than you think about yourself, God says, I'll give you my presence. I will give you my power. I will give you my peace. I will make you prosperous. I will make you successful. I will give you great honor. The very things that everybody is looking for in life comes out, come out of responding to life with an attitude of humility. In fact, James chapter 4 verse, verse 6 simply says, says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to to the humble. Circle that word opposes just for a second. The Bible says that God hates pride. Does God hate anything? Somebody said, oh yeah, <laughs> there are some things that God hates. And one of the things God hates is pride in its many forms, ego, arrogance, conceit, self-centeredness, self-promotion. God hates that stuff. And God says, the Bible says, rather, God opposes the, opposes the proud. And that means anytime I'm acting or saying something or thinking out of an attitude of pride in an arrogant or conceited way, I'm on the opposite side of God. I may have the right cause, but if I'm presenting it in pride, the bottom, God says you're doing it all wrong. God doesn't say, well, it's okay, you, you can get away with a little of that. God says, I hate pride and I will oppose it. So you're setting yourself up to fight with God. Ah, this isn't going to end well. I, I can just see that now. Can you see it? That's the negative side. But the positive side says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
the folks that are ready to take everything that he's given them, hone their gifts, their talents, their abilities, take advantage of the opportunities that he brings them to the best of their ability and add value to everybody else. And God says he gives grace to those people. What's grace? Well, grace is pretty powerful stuff. Grace is actually empower is God empowering me to do what he wants done his way. That's why we keep talking about staying in alignment with the design and the purposes and plans of God. Because when I'm doing God's will, God's way, he adds the power or the ability that's required. So even if I couldn't do it, I can because he's in it. So applying that to my life, it's the ability then to forgive when I don't feel like forgiving. Grace is the ability to resolve a conflict with my spouse when I don't feel like. Grace is the ability to compromise on God's terms. Grace is the ability to just get along. Grace is the ability to build a strong relationship. When everything wants to tear apart my marriage, my friendship, my, my work relationships, if I walk in step with the Spirit, if I move in alignment with the plans and purposes of God, then He will empower me to take those steps and make those steps. And while I'm doing it with His power, my heart gets filled with joy because I'm walking in harmony with God. So, I must never let pride be my guide. And today, I must be humble or I will stumble and my relationships will crumble. Hey, <laughs> there it goes. I'm a poet today. Let's pray together and wrap up this time that we share together, shall we? Father, we are grateful that you are so good and that you have empowered us to be value-added people in the circles and circumstances that you place us. Help us to be open to receive from others that you are giving, that you are putting in our circles so that we can receive the benefit and the blessing that they have to bring. And help us to turn around with our hearts full and be prepared as you give opportunity and ability to pour into the lives of others, whether the time is short or long, whether it's a smile or a lengthy conversation, pour into the lives of others that they may be blessed. Thank you, God, that you have poured into my life good things. Thank you, God, that you have poured into the lives of everyone that is listening to the sound of my voice, gifts, talents, and abilities, skills that they can hone and practice so that they can turn around and in humility bless others that are around them. Thank you for the much good that has been done in your name as you've empowered it. Thank you for giving us grace in our times of great need. Amen. Well, let me just put a couple of announcements on you before we close today. Third John chapter 1, verse 2, I prayed it again this morning for you. If you're part of our full gospel church circle, hey, if you're not, you let me know and I'll include you in my circle of prayer. I'd love to know who you are and where you're at and you can reach me. Let me give this to you just for free. Small letters, FGC for full gospel church, FGC at vaccine, that's V A X x i n e dot com full got fgc at vaccine dot com and let me know who you are and just say pastor i heard you on the live stream on the midweek study on philippians pray for me too and i'll do that for you as i'm praying for so many others here's what the bible says about our giving in this time honor the lord with your wealth and with the first and best part of all your income then your barns will be full and your vats will overflow with fresh wine. Well, how do you do that during COVID-19? Well, we're doing most of it online and we just wanna thank you for your support to this point. You can do it through the website, that's fgcniagara.com. Click on giving, the PayPal box will come up. 
pop in the amount and whatever information is required and we'll get it that way. Or you can do an e-transfer if you prefer, if you've got it set up with your bank, fullgospel.church1 at gmail.com and we're all set up on this end to take care of that. There is need in our community during this COVID-19 crisis and the Salvation Army and other community groups that run food banks have let us know that they stand in need and uh, because you can't get there in person if you'd like to donate a portion of your offering to the food bank the Salvation Army in particular please make note of it in an email to our secretary you can reach her at full gospel church secretary all one word please at gmail.com just let her know what portion of that offering you'd like to go to the Salvation Army and we'll do our best to make sure that it gets there looking for updates Google, put it in the box, Full Gospel Church of Niagara. What will come up is the website and the Facebook page. Go to the Facebook page. Caitlin is keeping that thing up daily. And so there are always fresh things there, especially this coming weekend as we trust God willing and the creek don't rise, we will be opening our doors to receive some of you who are able to come to a live service here at Full Gospel Church. 10 o'clock sharp on Sunday morning. You want to be here early because you've got to work your way through the process just like you do at the grocery store. We've got to line you up and get you in here carefully because your safety is paramount to us during this COVID-19 crisis. Now watch the website. I mean, watch the Facebook page because Caitlin's going to pop up a list there and then you will be able to sign up so that we know you're coming because in accordance with the government regulations, we're only allowed about 60 people total in the building. And so for the present time, that's all we can take. And so when Caitlin puts up that list, if you plan to attend on Sunday morning, you'll need to let us know as quickly as you possibly can. And we'll do our best to make sure that there's a place prepared for you there. Any other instructions that you'll need to follow, and there will be more than just that, I'll, I'll tell you that without looking, that, uh, but you can go ahead and check those. And all that stuff is gonna be coming up on the website as the weekend gets closer so keep checking back with facebook and uh, we'll let you know to the best of our ability what you need to do because we're looking forward to seeing as many of you as can on sunday morning live in the house now for those of you that aren't comfortable coming back yet uh, that's fantastic no problem we understand completely the live stream will be on at 10 o'clock on sunday morning and we're looking forward to sharing that time with you once again. And uh, all things being equal, we'll live stream it right from the sanctuary at Full Gospel Church and see how that works itself out best this week. All right. So I'm looking forward to seeing you, some of you in person yet this week. So stay in touch, stay, in, stay tuned in, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you this coming weekend for Father's Day. All right. God bless you. You have a fantastic week.